Okay, thank you. So, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Liu Zixi from School of Life Sciences. Today, I'm going to share with you my PhD project, the pollen tube teeth vesicles. We've seen flowers in every spring and summer. Uh, pollen grains come from flowers. Here, the left picture shows a flower from Arabidopsis, the model plant species. Uh, those small yellow grains are pollens. They show great diversity in size and shape among different plant species. Pollen grains from male floral organ will fall and attach to the stigma uh, during flowering time. After hydration, they will germinate and produce pollen tubes that penetrate the long pistil of female floral organ and finally reach the ovule for fertilization. Therefore, functional pollen tube is indispensable for successful fertilization and seed setting. Growing pollen tube is a typical uh, polar growing cell because it continuously senses the female guidance signal to grow towards the ovule. Um, although it has to penetrate the long female floral organ, it still has an amazing growing speed. In Arabidopsis, the fertilization can happen within four hours. We can easily collect pollen grains from flowers and culture or incubate them in in vitro germination media. We can also observe uh, fluorescence tagged proteins in, using live cell imaging. So it is a tractable single cell system for us to study uh, teeth growth of polar cells. The growth rate of a pollen tube can reach to 10 microns per minute. Such hustling growth attract us to seek their driving force. The fast growing pollen tube is featured by abundant tip vesicles and the grow, uh, at the tip vesicles in the tip region, the growing hotspot. Their establishment and coordination are very important for pollen tube growth. Uh, what do we know about these vesicles? Before this question, let's first get to know the structure of a pollen tube. A typical angiosperm pollen tube can be artificially divided into a shank region and cleared zone, which can be further divided into apex and sub-apex or shoulder region. And uh, tip vesicles just reside in the cleared zone and form an inverted cone there, which uh, we also call V-shape. You've already seen from previous movies, the tip vesicles are highly dynamic. By tracking the lipophilic spiral dye, FM64, uh, which is a common endocytosis marker, we understood that the tip vesicles undergo endocytosis. You can see from the left panel uh, that the stains uptake by growing pollen tube uh, uh, from the plasma membrane to the V-shaped tip vesicles and finally to the vacuole. By tracking GFP labeled tip localized protein with uh, confocal microscopy, we knew that the tip vesicles also undergo exocytosis. For example, uh, the right panel showing the GFP tag receptor like kinase, which is an endocytosis, uh, which is an exocytosis marker after photo bleaching the uh, tip signal of it, the green signal will gradually recover from the very apex to the shoulder region, meaning they are continuously transported to the tip region. So are the same population of tip vesicles responsible for both endocytosis and exocytosis? Are tip vesicles uniform? Clearly the answer is no. The first supporting fact is that functionally distinct tip localized proteins show partial colocalization under confocal microscopy. It is not likely that all these proteins localize in the same type of vesicles because their reported tag signals also have different patterns in the shank region. The compact tip vesicles actually hinder us from distinguishing them by confocal microscopy because most of tip vesicles size is smaller than the resolution limit of confocal microscopy. The second supporting evidence is that 
ultrastructure micrographs of clip vesicles show the heterogeneity of them. They are certainly not uniform. So here arising the questions, how many, uh, how many types of vesicles are there that function in the tip region? How to identify or define different types of tip vesicles? And uh, what are specific functions of different types of tip vesicles? Only after we answer the first two questions, can we get to know the functions of the tip vesicles? And for these two questions, we need to figure out ways to examine morphological features of tip vesicles to uh, explore molecular or protein identities of tip vesicles. And the last, also the most important one, match molecular identities with morphological features. For the first task, how can we get high resolution maps of tip vesicles? Let's first refer to the scales and resolution of various imaging techniques. From this diagram, we can see that the light microscopy, super resolution microscopy, and transmission electron microscopy are suitable for subcellular imaging. Then what about our pollen tube and tip vesicle sizes? Two diameter of commonly used model species can be gauged by micron. And the most discernible or the biggest vesicles, uh, biggest tip vesicles diameter is around 200 nanometer. So SRM and TEM should be enough to distinguish different types of tip vesicles. However, LM and SRM only reflect tag or stained structures, and we haven't got the full map of tip vesicles, especially their molecular identities and the match relationship between morphology and molecular identity, which means we are unable to tag unknown proteins representing unknown population of vesicles. So we can only choose TEM to address the first task. The middle panel shows two dimensional TEM micrograph of pollen tube tip region. And the right panel shows a typical tomographic slice generated by room temperature electron tomography. Clearly, room temperature electron tomography should be a better choice for us. Um, in this technology, we first cut the samples uh, into sections, usually 300 nanometer in thickness, then take, then take multiple 2D projection images under TEM machine over a wide range of viewing directions, followed by back projection of these 2D images to generate a 3D volume. Room temperature ET can be used to investigate small subcellular structures, such as Golgi stacks and related vesicles. And the resolution is limited to four nanometer, about the thickness of lipid bilayer. It has also been used to image large volume to get a wholesale view of different organelles with nanometer resolution. To obtain high resolution tip vesicles morphologies, we decided to use uh, RTET uh, to uh, observe the lily pollen tube tip region because lily pollen tube uh, has a relatively larger size. Uh, so as you can see from this movie, uh, our results show that tip vesicles of lily pollen tubes surely consists of distinct populations in terms of size, shape, and content. They include large secretory vesicles of around 200 nanometer in diameter, different types of electron dense vesicles with uh, large variations in size, mm, colored by purple and pink, uh, mini vesicles of 30 to 40 nanometers colored by green and typical classroom coated uh, peaks uh, along the plasma membrane indicated by these two white arrows. Interestingly, uh, extensive apoplastic tubular structures probably contributing to the formation of extracellular vesicles uh, colored by light yellow could be observed along the apical dome of plasma membrane within the cell wall. 
We can also confirm that the ER extends to the tip region, squeezing in between the secretory vesicles. So as you can see, this single tomographic volume can reveal the morphology distribution and fusion or shedding of various types of tip vesicles. Therefore, we intended to use the same method to collect larger volume covering the whole tip region to investigate the distribution pattern of different types of tip vesicles. As shown in this slide, uh, we choose small size Arabidopsis foreign tubes and collected a tomographic volume covering the whole tip region for next modeling. If we have a closer look at this whole tip tomogram, we can actually find similar tip vesicle populations in Arabidopsis samples. First, the large secretory vesicles indicated by cyan arrows, they are electron translucent, large and the most abundant. The different types of electron dense vesicles indicated by purple and pink arrows. The purple ones, uh, are membrane bounded. And the pink ones are more like membraneless granules, but they are denser than the purple ones. We can also find mini vesicles in Arabidopsis samples uh, indicated here. So you can see here is an example and another example here. The density of uh, mini vesicles uh, varies sometimes, uh, so this uh, may need further checking. There are also plasmin coated peds observed along the apical plasma membrane, pointed by white arrow here, and here another two examples. The extracellular vesicles of Arabidopsis are smaller and less complex than lilies but still we can find the connection between them and the plasma membrane indicated here by this arrow. So this tells us that the, these extracellular vesicles uh, are surely originated from the plasma membrane. Similarly, tubular ER uh, uh, sparsely decorated by ribosomes can be found to extend to the tip region of Arabidopsis foreign tube here are another two examples. So take a quick summary. Large volume tomogram of Arabidopsis pollen tube provides both morphological features and spatial distribution of tip vesicles. Once we finish the whole tip model drawing, so this is only the half uh, secretory vesicle model. Uh, so once uh, we finished the whole tip model drawing, we can have an, in, an insightful morphology and distribution map of tip vesicles. There is a problem in our RT-ET analysis though, that is the opening of secretory vesicles, which should be an artifact during free substitution and resin infiltration. Our solutions are further annotation by cryo-ET technique, and indirect morph morphometric analysis. For example, uh, the membrane boundary is clear in our room temperature data. So if we need to measure the volume of a secretory vesicle, we can first get the accurate membrane area of it, then calculate the sphere volume through several simple formula. As for cryo-ET, it has its own strength. Oh, our two minutes left. Thanks over room temperature ET. I'm not, go I'm not going to explain the details of this complex diagram. The point is that cryo ET allows direct imaging of hydrated, unstained biological specimens, which circumvent uh, multiple rounds of chemical treatment. That is to say, cryo ET provides native uh, structures, more native, closer to native structures than room temperature ET. Here is the example. Uh, uh, besides, uh, it also reached sub-nanometer resolution. So we test this system on colon tube samples, and this is the result. So as you can see, it shows uh, the ribosomes, uh, vesicle morphologies, and ER structures with an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented level. 
And we also tested in the larger size lily pollen tube. And as you can see here, it is really good at uh, resolving the structure of coated vesicles indicated here. And it can also reflect some uh, structures of the actin filament here. So take a quick summary. What we have known from current data are tip vesicles of fast growing pollen tube is heterogeneous. And, ex uh, and uh, based on these uh, data, we can further ask the uh, questions uh, in terms of dynamic sub, uh, subpopulation, uh, biogenesis, and their functions. The rest two tasks are molecular identities and the matching. To explore the molecular identities of tip vesicles, we propose to first isolate tip vesicles from pollen tubes and verify the obtained fractions followed by proteomic analysis on purified uh, vesicle membrane fractions. So these are the general workflow. So uh, many thanks to my professors, Professor uh, Zhang Li Wen and Professor Chen Kennis, and my uh, collaborators, Dr. Philip Erdman, Professor Xiang Yun, and uh, all my lab members in LG 101. Thank you very much. Uh, questions are welcome. Thank you, Ms. Liu. So uh, if you have any questions, please uh, raise it in the chat room and we will project it on the screen. Um, professors, do you have any questions? Thank you. Uh, this is the interesting research. Uh, can I ask you, how do you know um, the part that you identified from the uh, electron microgram, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of a function do they have? Do we know that at this stage? Uh, we know part of them. Uh, for example, the secretory vesicles, that is a name, uh, so followed uh, previous studies. So uh, let me show the, yeah, so this slide. So they call this large uh, electron translucent vesicles, secretory vesicles, and the label shows that it, it is related to uh, <clears throat> early endosome and, uh, uh, and also another protein, uh, another cell wall related protein uh, is also labeled here. So they think that uh, these secretory vesicles is related to cell wall formation. Uh, and actually we only know uh, to this, what we know is only to this level. So we, they only think that these tip vesicles are tip vesicles and no other populations. So actually uh, these, Denser, electron denser vesicles, uh, we have no uh, functional information about it. So that is uh, why I'm going to purify them and, and then yeah, do the further analysis. Okay, uh, this yeah. is certainly a very interesting research. I know this is tough, difficult to actually get to this level of resolution. But I also want to say that, uh, you know, just imagine that we have our hand and our arm. Mm -hmm. and that on a microscope, suppose the two separate parts, the hand and arm will appear to be very different. But without the arm, the hand would not exist, although they would appear separately. So identify the relationship and internally how they are connect to each other would also be very interesting. Yeah, 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 that's sure. But I, but I think first is to tell, tell others that it, it it surely has other populations. I, I, I try, I'm trying to prove that. And then, uh, and, and then to define them. So why, why I call them a different population. Yeah, and then to their identity. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Song, and thank you, Ms. Liu. So good morning, everyone. I'm Koyi Hiss from School of Life Science and I'm a PhD student in cell and molecular biology. 
And today I'm really glad that I can present here with you a topic is about the functional link between cerebellum and autism using a preclinical mouse model. So first of all, what is autism spectrum disorder? Actually, it's a new developmental disorder first name recognized by Dr. Neil Kenner in 1943, who is a Austrian psychiatrist who discovered a group of children with normal intelligence, but abnormal in social interaction. So now the occurrence of ASD is much higher in males than females. And as there are more research increasing nowadays, and we can find that the prevalence is already up to one in 100 individuals in the world. So as this is called autism spectrum disorder, which means that this disease contains lots of symptoms. So how can we define whether a patient or a mouse model is autistic? And the work is done by American Psychiatric Association using the manual called DSM-5. And in this manual, it's a disease called that autism patients or a model will have two major characteristics which are the deficit in social communication and also the repetitive behavior. So why this autism research is remaining very hard in the scientific field? Because until now, the pathogenesis and corresponding mechanisms are remain speculated. So for the role of cerebellum, actually cerebellum has two major roles, including the motor coordination center, which control our muscle system and our balance. So that's, so that's why we can walk normally on the street without swinging. And also cerebellum is involved in cognitive functions, in, in the language learning, pain perceptions, motor learning, and also involved in decision making. As the cerebellum circuitry has been linked to other brain regions through the white matter area. And in the picture, we can see that there is a sectional section of the cerebellum. And actually, the cerebellum can be divided into three major layers. For the first layer, which is the outermost layer, is the molecular layer, which we can see there is a dendritic tree of the Perkin cell extensively branched right there, which receives the outputs from different regions. And also the second layer underneath the monocular layer is the protein cell layer, which we can see the protein cell, which is the sole output neuron in the cerebellum. And for the innermost layer is called a granular cell layer. There we can see the granular cells situated right there, which fulfills excitatory inputs to the protein cell. And why I try to link cerebellum to autism? Because most probably scientists may think that autism should be related to the prefrontal cortex, as it's a well-known region that it coordinates our body parts. However, these two pieces of information have changed my mind. And here, for the first one, is about the prefrontal cell density in patients with autism. And here have the graph has shown that actually in the loop seven, which controls the facial motor function of human and the cerebral vellum, there is a significant decrease in the progenital cell density. And which means that the progenital cell has been affected in some of the region of the cerebral in the patient. And also another information is about the motor defects in children with autism and have a survey have done to see whether there are these children with our uh, motor behavior. However, after the test have been done uh, by the movement ABC2 test in terms of the man manual dexterity, ball skills, and static and dynamics balance, it was found that this group of children have a significantly lower movement score when compared to control group, which indicate that maybe these two information has shown that autism is related to cerebellum. So as I mentioned that the pathogenesis of autism is way unknown. So how can I study using a model? And here I would like to introduce with you the purporic acid right here, which I call it CPA. So CPA is a drug that is used for mood stabilizing and anti-epileptic for decades ago. But after a doctor has discovered that this drug should have been related to ASD and increasing the risk of the babies of 4.42% to have autism. So they stopped using it. 
And nowadays, researcher has been used destructive induced autistic mouse model that mimic the idiopathic autism in human. And here is a timeline that's showing of my showing of my research. And for the embryotic tampon by I inject PP to IP using 500 microgram per kg concentrations. And after the mother has been given birth to babies, the PPE pups were subject to perform behavioral tests, including the fishing bird grooming tests, et cetera. And then at the postnatal day 50, which is the adolescent age of the mice, the mice have been utilized for biochemical and histological tests. And so after the PPE induction, how can we verify that PPE mouse models are uh, uh, autistic? So here is the free chamber test. And we can see that from the photo, they are free chamber. And for this test, it, uh, it can be defined in two stage. For the first stage, we will be allowed for the mice, subject mice to move freely between the chamber. And there will be a stranger mice in one region and then another empty cage in one region. We will try to calculate the time they spend with these two places. And for the second stage, it's also for timeless. And the subject mice will be allowed to move freely between these two regions for timeless. And there will be a familiar mice and also lawful mice. So the time they spend with the mice when sleezing will be calculated by software. And here is the result showing you that actually when compared to control group, which is the saline group, it has a significant difference in the preference of stranger and also lawful mice in the first and the second stage. However, for the PPA mice, which it assumed it is autistic, it has no significant preference between stranger and lawful mice. So, which means that PPA exposed uh, mice do not have preference to lawful and stranger mice, which has uh, which may indicate it has some impairment in social interaction. So for the next is about the repetitive behavior. As I mentioned that not only in social interaction, a autistic patient or a mouse model should have to be repetitive uh, to confirm that as a autistic mouse model. So here is a grooming test, which I try to put the mice in the normal bright environment. And then I try to calculate uh, a grooming time on this within 20 minutes. So grooming is a normal behavior of the mice, which they will try to watch uh, their bodies from the head to the toes. But why uh, is abnormal? Because it was found that in PPE mice, there is, there is a significantly higher grooming time within the 20 minutes, which means the mice can, uh, for example, the lice can groom for five minutes within 20 minutes, minutes, which is very abnormal. So it has confirmed that for the PPE mice, it got uh, a autistic, be uh, autistic behavior. And also this test is called a marble bearing test. We can see that when we compare to control, PPMA mice seems they would like to stay at one corner within 30 minutes, which indicate that the PPA mice may be afraid of the novel objects. So after I have mentioned the autistic behavior and the PPA mice model, so the cerebral development has been affected. So here is the first piece of information. We can see that when compared to control, the PPA mice has a cockatiel structure. So why that's important? Because the tail is the first place of the mice growing as neural tube. So if there is some defects in the tails, which means that this mice may have some problems in the brain. So further, I performed the sagittal sessions H and E staining. And also after statistically calculation, it was found that the surface area of cerebellum and the right matter area was significantly reduced. And then I also investigate on the gabonergic system. As if you remember that I mentioned protein cell, which is in the protein cell layer, is a sole output neurons in the cerebellum, which sends signaling to other parts of the brain. So actually protein cell is a gabonergic cell, which is uh, the inhibitory output neurons in the cerebellum. So that's why we are leading gabonergic system right there is important. So for here, I try to perform the mRNA expression investigation, and you can find that for the GAT65, GAT67, which are the GABA production enzymes, has a significant down regulation. 
And also, not only there's two isoform of enzyme, the GABA with sub two alpha one, alpha three also has a silicon reduction, which means that actually the GABA receptors in the prosynaptic site is also affected. Surprisingly, there is an increase in the GABA receptor beta one expression. So it may show that actually GABA subunit may have different mechanism in the PP mouse model. And I also confirmed the GABA production enzyme gap 65, 67 expression by protein intoxication. And it was found that they also silicon reduce. So next is about the staining of the gap 65 and gap 67. And we can find that from the figure for the gap 67 staining, it was found that there is a silicon reduction in the molecular layer. Which molecular layer, as if you remember, is the area that of the dendritic tree of the producer cells locate. So not only in the GAP67 expression, for the GAP65, there also is silicon reduction, no matter in the molecular layer and also the granule cell, cell, cell layer in the PPA mice. So after the galvanogenic uh, receptor and enzyme investigations, so it's the glutamate or galvanogenic transported protein recycling has been affected. So here we also investigate the GAP1 and also the glutamate transporter. And we also find that from the figures, this arrow has pointed out that the area near to the pancreas cells in the PPA cell bottom, there is a silicon reduction in the signaling of GAP1, which means that the GAP1 recycling in the postsynaptic site may also affect in PPA mice. And however, for the glutamate transporter, as glutamate is the raw materials making GABA, GABA proteins. And here it was found that the glutamate transporter was not as fat when compared to control. So this concludes that PPA has the fat, the GABA energetic production enzyme, the, the GABA transporter proteins, but not the glutamate transporter in cerebellum sessions. So here is a short conclusion that this study has shown the structural development and transport protein under PPA induced autism. And also I have shown you that the down regulation of GABA cell volume synthesis and transport protein. And to the future, why this is important because scientists have been focused on the research to the prefrontal cortex before for related to autism. However, now we, we may cannot examine the role of cerebellum in trigger also in parasocial interaction in repetitive behavior in autistic patients. And this study has laid a foundation for cerebellum galvanogenic metabolic proteins as a potential therapeutic target. So at last, I want to sincere thanks my supervisor, Professor K.M. Guam from School of Life Science, which has provided me a lot of kind support and guidance and also Ms. Lim for the technical support and also my teammates in SDG 96 of CUHK. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for a patient listening and questions that welcome. Thank you, Ms. Ma. So uh, we've got a question from the chat room. Okay, let me occur in this way so much fun. Okay, anyway, so I start answering the first question. It's about the occurrence rate of, of autism differs so much between males and females. So with such chromosome are the babies mice used in the okay. So I have to answer that actually. The occurrence weight is really high in mouse and females, and also it happens in the baby mice. And what I think, uh, why is occurrence in sex chromosome? 
Uh, I'm not familiar with such commotion, by, but I believe that what, what, why that why a small effect is related to the hormones and also the behavior of the mice. Because as I performed the behavioral test, it was found that um, the male mice is more active, which means that during the social interaction test, they may show a bigger difference. I think it's related to hormones, but I don't know whether it's also related to sex hormones, but it is an interesting topic to investigate later. And the baby, I, I use both male and female, but I also compare the result between male and females. And there is really a difference in the male's occurrence. So another question is about tails to defects in the baby. So do you say, yes, yes, I think it also contribute because I have quite, I have read a paper recently which about the neural two defects in the PPE mice, and it also investigate for the PPE mice in the embryotic stage, and it's all it also show that uh, at this at that stage, the the neural two defects was more obvious after before before they developed their whole cells, and this paper also show show uh, show that after this. This result, the babies give birth, they have autistic behavior. And any portion of the Yes. Actually, the PPA has affected histone as acetylations. And there are many papers related to PPA with that. So that's why I try to investigate it in the cerebellums. Uh, but how is it? important to cerebellum development. Um, yeah, I think, okay, why I related it with the GABAergic system? Because I have found piece of information that PPA has, has, may affect the motor defects. And so I try to link it with cerebellum. Any thoughts on the effect? Oh, thank you. Okay, that's all the question. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ma. Oh, what's oh, it? One more question. What is the proposed mechanism that I think with this gobber? I think that the gobber has been affected not only in the postnatal stage, but also very early in the embryotic stage. So probably there will be effects on the galvanogenic newborn development at that stage. So it would be an interesting topic to uh, investigate more on that. So because PP may act on that gabber interneurons or neurons, output neurons at that stage. Yeah, let's further let you investigate more about this, whether it will lead to seizure or hyperneuronal activity. So actually I'm now performing more about the motor behavioral tests. So try to push that. I can, and I can see that from the motor motor tests, which investigate whether it has motor defects, they are a slightly different. But I cannot push that. So I, I need further investigation for more tests, for example, for the balance. I think um, it's time to the next speaker. So okay, thank, thank you, Ms. You Ma, so again. Um, so uh, may we now invite our next speaker, Ms. Wang Qianwen, ESX PhD student in molecular biology. Ms. Wang, please. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Wang Chenwen and I'm a student from School of Life Science and my supervisor is Professor Ho Ming Lam. Today, I'm going to share the histone multiplication H3K4 trimethylation marks functional gene sync solving nodules. Let's start with the background of this project. Uh, what we are studying here is solving. Solving is an important crop. It is reported to be the third most economically significant crop at around 45 billion per year. 
and besides this, sorbing contains high protein and oil due to risk factor. Sorbing is widely used as the food for the animal and human, and also widely used in the industry. And as we know that uh, sorbing is belong to the lagoon family. Lagoon could contribute to symbiotic nitrogen fixation with certain rhizobians in root nodules. And during the symbiotic nitrogen fixation, the nitrogen will be converted to the ammonia, which could be used by the plants directly. And among all the lagoon, sorbing contributes to 77% of the symbiotic nitrogen fixation of the total lagoon production. So sorbing is one of the crucial crops to study symbiotic nitrogen fixation. Although the scientists have been uh, made great efforts on the genetics discovery of the lagoon modulations, the epigenetics become a hot topic in recent years. And the epigenetics refers to changing the gene's expressions without changing DNA sequence. And it could group into the histone modification and the DNA macerations. So in DNA macerations, the mutant of the DNA demethylase inhibit the formation of nodules in multicargo and also inhibit the nitrogen physicians in multicargo. And another paper confirmed, double confirmed left the hypo DMR was found in the modulation related genes. And recently, a new paper published that during the formation of nodules, the DNA methylation was increased in Glaximax. And as for histone modifications, previously uh, by performing chip qPCR, five genes expression was uh, found to correlate with the level of H3K27 trimethylation and the H3K9 acetylations. Besides this, a statistic account of four histone modifications was published in uh, Multicargo previously. And also, by knocking down the H3K4 trimethylation method transferase in common things, uh, it will inhibit the nitrogen physician. So as the H3K4 trimethylation is an, is an important histone modification, and it's, it refers to an additional of three methyl group add to the lasting four residues of the histone H3 proteins. And it was reported to positively correlated with the transcription activations in both mammalia and plants. However, uh, no study conducted genome-wide profiling of H3K4 trimethylations in mature nodule and the remaining loops. So in our project, we want to uncover what kinds of genes were marked by H3K4 trimethylations in soybean nodules. To achieve our goal, we choose our cultivar soybean Glycimax COA inoculated with Stanorhizobia freddy R4. And the mature, mature nodules and the remaining loops were collected after 25 to 28 days post inoculations. And to get a high confidence expression result, two independent sets of RNA seq were analysis here. And after getting the sequencing rates from the company, Firstly, the principal components analysis and the Pearson correlation analysis show that our RNAs data were highly reproducible. Basically, the rep biological replicates from the same sample chimps to cluster together, and then the nodules and the remaining loops was distinctly separated into two groups. And then we performed a differentially expressed analysis of two sets of RNA seq. Uh, here's the vampire result. Uh, only the genes that common to the both set were used in the further analysis. Uh, I will call differentially expressed genes DEG later. And then before moving into chip sequencing, the Western protein result identified that the H3K4 trimethylation was significantly increased in nodules while compared to the remaining loops. So after observing these big differences, we performed a, a we prepared a sample for chip sequencing of H3K4 trimethylation in nodules and the remaining loops. And firstly, the Pearson correlation analysis showed that our chip data are highly reproducible between the replicates. And then we call the peaks against the input control. Totally, we got around 37 to 38,000 peaks after calling against the input control. And then we wonder where is this peak located? So the pie chart here shows the distribution of uh, this peak in the genomic regions.
Basically, a higher proportion could be found in gene body region than other genomic regions. And besides this, the global distribution of H3K4 tamatization in a uh, gene body region was brought here. Um, and a typical peak could be found just uh, after the uh, transcriptional star set. This is uh, consistent with other studies. And then we perform a differentially uh, enriched region analysis between a nodules and a remaining root of H3K4 trimethylations. Basically, uh, 6,000 peaks could be found upregulated, and 3,000 peaks, or around 3,000 peaks, could be found downregulated in nodules. This is consistent with, with our Western plotting results. And then we define the genes that contain the differential region as a promoter or gene body as a differentially enriched region related genes. I will call this GRG later. Uh, here it shows the vampro uh, between the DG and the DRG. Basically, we have around 50% to 60% the DRG overlap with DEG in the same directions. So to dig more for these higher proportions, the Spearman correlation between the ratio of H3K4 time isolation and the transcript were calculated. A positive correlation could be found. And then from the heat map here shows the chip signal level, a higher chip signal was correlated with a higher gene expression. So from here, the positive correlation could be found between DEG and a DRG. Then to further prove our sequencing result, the chip qPCR and the real-time qPCR validation was conducted on dozens of selected genes. Here only shows four representative genes as an example. As you can see here, the first track here shows the sequencing result of H3K4 time isolation, and the red box highlights the differential regions, followed by the sequencing result of the RNAC and the validations. All the validations match our sequencing results. So after this, we perform the gene ontology annotation of the upregulated DEG overlap with DRG in audios. So firstly, two important terms could be found here. That is the nodulation and the nitrogen phasation. We know that the function of nodule is doing nitrogen phasation. And besides this, the terms related to the carbon and the de novo purine biosynthesis pathway could be found here. The exchange between the carbon and the nitrogen is a fundamental process during the nodulations. So we pro the nitrogen and the carbon metabolic pathway here. The first heat map here shows the histone modifications level, and the second heat map here shows the expression level. And the red color indicates a higher level, and then the blue color indicates a low level. As you can see here, most of the genes in these two pathways were upregulated by H3K4 trimethylation, which further proof that H3K4 trimethylation marks functional genes in soybean nodules. So then we perform a gene autonomy an analysis of the downregulated DEG overlap with DRGs. Firstly, the terms related to the defense response could be found here. It is assumed that the repression of plant immunity plays a crucial role during the nodulations. And besides this, the transcriptional factor activity could be found here. After we found these terms, we download on the transcriptional factor of Glycimax from plant TFDB database and by hydrogeometry distribution uh, test, the TF classification and the enrichment analysis show that WOKI and the HDZ transcriptional factor was significantly enriched in DEG, DRG, and the DEG overlap with DRG data set. Uh, we know that the WOKI family was regulated defense response in plants. This leading us thinking that maybe H3K4 trimethylation will mark some key TF and then the linking the downregulated target genes in, in nodules. So to check whatever the TFs along with its targets was significantly enriched, we'll download a regulatory map from plant TFDB. And by significant test, seven TF that mark with a lower level of H3K4 trimethylation could be found here. And then an integrated network was constructed based on only seven TFs. As you can see, uh, the orange color here represents the TF, and the circle with green color indicates their tar targets. And by gene autonomy annotation of all the genes in the integrated network shows that the defense responsive 
related terms were enriched here. And besides this, four of the, uh, these transcriptional factors were belong to the Wokey family, and the subnetwork comprising these four Wokey were shown here. The homolog of these uh, genes in Arabidopsis were shown to be important components to resistance. So from here, the loss of H3 cable trimethylation was found on, on some key TF and then may potentially link in the downregulated responses network in nodules. Besides this, the terms that transport activity were enriched in both up and the downregulated data set. We know that the transportation between the host and the rhizobium is an important process in the relations. So we extract all these transporter and group them into four groups. Firstly, um, in sugar transporter, there are, uh, there are, we have uh, extract 16 genes here. As you can see, the bidirectional regulation of H3 K4 trimethylation could be found in the sugar transporters. Besides this, two of these uh, sugar transporter are belong to the sweet sugar families. The sweet sugar families was reported to upregulated in multicargo previously. And then as for the peptide transporter, the peptide transporters along with the key transporters in arabidosis, uh, a, a final genetic tree was constructed based on the peptide transporter and the key transporters from the arabidosis. And as you can see here, the upregulation could be found in a glucosinolate transporter and the downregulation could be found on the nitrate transporter. Well, the bidirectional regulation could be found in the peptide and the oligopeptide transport. Besides this, as for animal assay transporter, the final genetic tree, along with the key orbidosis um, genes, uh, or orbidosis animal acid uh, transporters were constructed here. The upregulation of animal assay pyramid and the cationic animal assay transporter could be found here. Besides this, the downregulation of the GABA and the polyamide uptake and then the bidirectional animal acid transporter could be found. And also the bidirectional regulation could be found in the lysine histidine transporters. And lastly, as for our transporter, the bidirectional regulation could be found in the sulfate and the phosphate transporter. Besides this, the upregulation could be found in the ion, zinc, and the copper transporter. Since previous study has conducted uh, several ion transporter in solving nodules, I have these uh, genes that have been studied in previous uh, researches, and our expression data match the data that pu published previously. So from here, the bidirectional regulation of H3 cable trimethylation was found in different families of transporters. As a conclusion, the H3 cable trimethylation level were positively correlated with the transcription in nodules and the remaining loops. And also the genes closely related to the nodules functions were marked with a higher level of H3 K4 trimethylation. Then the loss of H3 K4 trimethylation in several tier may potentially repress the defense related regulatory network in nodules. And the bidirectional regulation of H3 K4 trimethylation were found in different families of transmembrane transporter. And if you want to know any detail of this project, please kindly check our papers in genomics. And at the last, I want to say thanks my supervisor, Professor Lam, for his great support on this whole project. And I also want to thank my co-supervisor, Professor Zhang, for his kind suggestions. And I want to, besides this, I want to thank Vincent and Jilly for working together on this project and all other lab mates from Professor Lam's lab. Thank you. And any questions are welcome. Thank you, Ms. Uh, thank you for this very interesting presentation. Um, I wonder, uh, toward the later part of your slide, mm. uh, you talked about uh, the ion transporter and uh, copper transporter. Um, I was wondering that um, um, would this, how would this work? Um, if this, this transporter part, would this be affected by the histone or or this does not affect? Uh, the histone modification, does that change the way the ion transport or copper transport? Um, yes, yes, thanks for your questions. 
So in our hypothesis, I think all, um, all the strings expression will be in fact by the H3K4 trimethyl. That means if we don't have uh, this modification, maybe the transportation will be lower, then it will affect the efficiency of the nitrogen in nodules. That's what we have to say. Yes. And this transporter a... was um, proved to be uh, influenced. If we mutate this transporter, for example, one of the ion transporters that have been published previously, if we mutate it of this transporter, the nitrogen precision will be lower. Yes. Uh, we have oh. a question in the chat room. Um, are there any changes in the uh, methylase uh, and the methylase levels in the nodules of the soil beans? Uh, thanks, thanks for your questions. That's, it's very, very good questions. So actually we have checked the expression level of the histone methyl transferase and the demethylase level in soybean nodules. Um, one of the homologs of the ATX1, which is the h 3 k 4 trimethylation methyl transferase in um, soybean was upregulated in, in soybean. Yes. Actually they have many uh, up, both up and down, um, it's down both, both both up regulation and the down regulation changes in uh, of the histone of the methyl transferase and the demethylase in soybean nodules. Mm. If do we if we don't have any more questions, so uh, thank you, Ms. Wang, and let's welcome our next speaker, Ms. Yang Huan. Um, she is the year two PhD student in biochemistry. Ms. Yang, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yang Huan from biochemistry. And today my presentation is uh, to introduce the progress on my uh, uh, project. And the project is uh, dissecting the pathogenic mechanisms of cerebellum uh, so, uh, spinal cerebellum ataxia induced by CCDC ATC mutations in mice. And my presentation will be divided into four main sections. The first is the background. Spinal cerebellar ataxia is a group of autosomal dominant uh, neurodegenerative diseases characterized by progressive degeneration in the spinal cord, brainstem, and cerebellum. And here now more than 40 subtypes of uh, SCAs have been found, each caused by different mutations. And uh, SCA40 is one of the dominant form of SCAs, which is uh, uh, driven by the mutations in coiled coil domain containing ATAC gene, which is also called CCTC ATC gene or SCA40 gene. And we know this disease from two family cases. The first is a two generation family in Hong Kong. Uh, the proband and other six uh, individuals were recruited for whole exome sequencing analysis. And uh, all the five affected family uh, members were shown to have R464H mutation in ccdc ATC gene. And the second is a four generation um, family in Poland. And um, D43N uh, mutation in CCCTC gene was found in all the uh, affected family members and absent in non-affected members. And all the SCA40 patients uh, have the uh, classical uh, toxic symptoms such as unsteady gait and tremor. And all, uh, most of the patients have the mild uh, disease onset after 40 years old and the symptoms worsened with age. And interestingly, both the R46H and D43N mutations locate in the highly conserved hook domain of ccdc ATC gene, uh, which means that the mutations may affect the function of ccdc ATC protein. And this protein has the highest average expression level in human cerebellum. Uh, next is some uh, mechanistic mechanism uh, studies on the two mutations. And the previous studies uh, found that the alpha 6 h mutate, mutate proteins could induce the hyperphosphorylation of GNK in SC40 patients' primary fibroblasts and hexanase cells. 
Well, differ this way, a mutant could cause GNK hyperphosphorylation and CASP3 activation in both right primary cortical neurons and hectomethyl cells. And uh, uh, since GNK pathway is an important pathway for a uh, neural cell apoptosis, so the, uh, uh, these studies suggested that the CCD CATC mutation may induce this, uh, the uh, GNK activation and uh, the trigger uh, cell apoptosis. So uh, in order to find out if the GNK stress pathway and cell death occur in vivo, we decided to study pathogenic pathways in details in the animal disease models. Uh, the objectives of my study include characterize phenotypes and verify the toxicity of the two mutations in knocking mouse models and identify disease signaling pathways in the models. Uh, next is some uh, experiment, uh, is the, some results of, the, of some animal experiments. We established two lines of CCDC ATC knocking mouse models and identified the well type. A uh, heterozygous mutant type and the homozygous mutant uh, through genotyping. And today, uh, we mainly compare the well type and heterozygous mutant group. And uh, the, the way to result, uh, we uh, started the experiments when the mice are around 12 months. And the weight results show that there is no significant difference in body weight between the well type and mutant groups. And uh, phenotypic examinations include uh, behavioral performance, with, which is to observe if the mutations could affect the mo mobility of the mutant mice. And the morphological changes focus on the degeneration in the cerebellum. And cellular histologies focus on the cellular degeneration and the GNK activation. Um, behavioral tests include rotor rod, balance beam, and hanging roll. And the uh, for, uh, all, all the uh, experiments were repeated four times a day for consecutive three days. And for rotor road tests, we let the mice run on a rotating road and accelerated the uh, rotating speed from 4 to 40 RPM in two minutes. And the bar chart showing that the alpha 6 h group uh, had uh, mm, took a uh, short, stayed on the Rod for a shorter time than the well type and before the three N groups. And uh, the, um, for the balance beam test, we let the mice uh, run a 90 centimeter beam from the lower end to the higher end and recorded the time. And results show that the mutant groups uh, took longer time to complete running on the beam. And the alpha 6 h group showed significance. And for hand wheel tests, uh, we uh, um, put the mice a uh, hand upside down from the well to observe uh, how long they would last. And uh, results show that R46H and D43M both uh, persisted for a shorter time than the well type group and both showed significance. And uh, from the papers, we know that for SA40 patients, they generally show different degrees of unsteady gait, dysarthria, and tremor. And from the behavior tests, we know that for the SA40 mice disease models, the mutant groups all show different degrees of impairment in locomotor performance, especially the R46H group. And but the uh, behavior test behavior test results are not enough for drawing a conclusion. So the impairments should be further validated in morphological and the cellular changes. When compare the uh, exo MRI image for the healthy individual and the SA40 patients, we can find mild atrophy of the pons and the cerebellar hemispheres. So we we would like to examine the cerebellum deterioration in mutant mice and investigate the exact regions of cerebellum being degenerated. And let me introduce the morphology of the cerebellum first. The cerebellum is a region of brain, which is uh, uh, essential for controlling the movement and balance. And the upper left is a dorsal view of an adult mouse, mm, of, of the cerebellum. 
uh, adult mouse cerebellum. And the upper right is the uh, sagittal section of the uh, cerebellum when they cut it in half along the vermis. And uh, it normally has 10 lobules and four transverse domains, which is anterior domain, central domain, posterior domain, and nodular domain. And the lower picture shows the cortex of the cerebellum, uh, which consists of three distinct layers, the outer molecular layer, uh, middle Purkinje cell layer, and the inner granular layer. For human beings, the anterior region of the cerebellum mainly receives inputs from the spinal cord, and the deterioration of the anterior lobe will cause ataxic symptoms such as unsteady gait. So, uh, to examine the morphological changes of the cerebellum in mutant mice, we applied HNE staining uh, for the paraffin sections of the cerebellum samples. The area of each lobule and the number of granular cells were measured or counted. And the results show that the area for lobby one and two, which is located in the anterior region of cerebellum, and the number of granular cell in mutant groups were reduced when compared with the wild-type group. This study suggested that the, uh, there may be atrophy happened in the anterior domain of the cerebellum, and the degeneration may mainly occur in the granular cell layer. Then I applied immunofluorescence staining for the, uh, to examine the cellular change, changes in the Purkinje cells. And the results showed that the number of Purkinje cells significantly decreased in the cerebellum of mutant mice. And since the previous studies suggested GNK activation in sa 4 t patients, primary fibroblast and hexanized red cells, uh, we decided to validate these findings in uh, the two mutations knocking mouse cerebellum samples. And Western blotting results showed that the intensity of the bands for phosphorylated GNK of the mutant groups are stronger than the wild type group, which is consistent with the patient fibroblast data. And uh, so from the papers, we know that for SA40 patients, MRI showed mild atrophy in the cerebellum and the GNK activation was found in the patient's primary fibroblasts. And uh, from the above experimental results, we know that SA40 mice disease models have uh, uh, the uh, HNE staining showed the degeneration might occur in the granular layer in the anterior region of the cerebellum. And immunofluorescent staining showed Purkinje cell loss. And Western blotting assay also showed the increase of phosphorylated GNK in mutant groups. Uh, actually, the experiments are not finished yet, and the cellular changes and the mechanisms still need to be further validated by more methods. And summary. To investigate the pathogenesis of SA40, we generated two CCDC ATC knocking mouse models. And the mutant mice showed significant impairment of mobility in behavior tests. And cere cerebellar atrophy sites were detected in the anterior domain of cerebellum, and the cellular changes may occur mainly in the granular cell layer and Purkinje cell layer. And the level of phosphorylated GNK increased in mutant groups, which means that the cellular degeneration may be related to the activation of GNK apoptotic pathway. And the long-term significance of my study, um, uh, we established two lines of SA40 mouse models, which are uh, long-term disease, uh, toxic disease models. And our find, uh, findings indicate that the R46H and D43 mutant protein may cause cellular degeneration in the anterior domain of the mouse cerebellum. And for the study aims to identify more signaling pathways activated by the mutations in the CCDC ATC gene. We sincerely thank Professor Kim Guan and Ms. Chloe Ma for the support of my study. And uh, also thank the Research Grants Council and Hong Kong Pitch Fellowship, and also the support and suggestions from my lab members and my supervisor. Uh, 
that's all for my presentation. And uh, my project is far from complete. So uh, any uh, suggestions or questions are welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. So questions are welcome. Uh, we have one question in the chat room. Um, actually two questions, okay, one by one. We have one question um, before okay. these two. Uh, you may need to scroll up a little bit. Jack Colo have two questions. Uh, uh, first is, what is the known function of CCDCATC and how are for 6 h mutation change the protein function? Uh, actually, uh, CCDCATC, uh, the function of CCDCATC is uh, known for um, uh, to uh, have the function, uh, show the function in uh, some other diseases such as uh, the, the could, uh, Activate the WNT pathway, and but uh, the fun so uh, actually we uh, know this uh, protein for the sorry. Uh, we uh, we know this disease because we find two mutations in this protein, and this protein uh, was uh, found to uh, found to uh, have um, found to have uh, in in some other diseases such as hydrocephalus. And so uh, we, uh, the, the further uh, studies of, uh, of my uh, project uh, aims at to uh, find out how it function uh, in the uh, GNK pathway or other more signaling pathways. And uh, how the R46H mutation change the protein function uh, is also one of the direction of my studies. So uh, we uh, haven't uh, know the uh, specific function of this protein yet because there is uh, not too much uh, information about this protein. Thank you. In the chat room, you need to scroll up. Um, the question that it is the first question, you may scroll up. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, are there any changes found in spinal cord? Uh, actually, we only uh, found the changes in the cerebellum and we didn't take the sam uh, spinal cord samples. So, uh, there is mm, not uh, the information for the spinal cord yet. Okay, this question from Jack Wong. Uh, are you planning to test some small molecules and see whether they can rescue the disease phenotypes in the mutant mice? Uh, actually, we are uh, on the pro um, progress, process to uh, find out the mechanisms of the uh, underlying the uh, pathogenic, pathogenic processes. So uh, uh, when we find out the um, pathways that are responsible for the degeneration of uh, the um, 
of the cerebellum and uh, the function of the CCDC ATAC uh, in the process, uh, we can uh, we can identify the uh, maybe we can we can identify some molecules to target the pathway or the specific uh, mm, the, the specific proteins to rescue the disease phenotypes. So maybe that's the future work. And now we are only in the, it's only in the start. Thank you.